And just to emphasize those announcements, um, please, the New Believers class, there's been so many people who have stood up to receive Christ. I, I, I think around 60 or give or take in the last six weeks. It, it's incredible. Um, and for years now, I, I've almost, in my doubt and lack of faith, I'm wondering when it's going to end. But I realized because the gospel is so powerful, it'll never end. And so, you know, this um, New Believers class will help you. If you haven't taken it, it doesn't mean you, only those who've stood up. If you've never taken a New Believers Bible class, sign up for that class at the Connect Station today. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I forget, it's four or six weeks or something like that, once or twice a week. And... You'll learn a lot. You'll get a certificate at the end, and we know how much we love certificates, so sign up for that class. And then the next three weeks, we have guest speakers. They're putting me out of a job. I think they should pay me to come preach. Uh, but they're good friends of mine, and they're good preachers, so that's the next three Sundays, coming all the way from the States. Years ago, when we were in Rieti House... <clears throat> Um, we had a, the top floor, half of the top floor of Rieti House. Some of you may know it. It's uh, above Cooperative Bank in that building. And our church has always grown slowly. I, I think a combination of things. I, I, I think the predominant is um, how controversial I can be at times and people get mad at me. Um, I would encourage you deeply to read John Stott's book, Christ the Controversialist. There has never been somebody in the history of our faith, other than the founder of our faith, who was the most controversial person who's ever walked the face of the earth. That book will really encourage you to stand strong and courageous as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. But I'll never forget a Sunday, somebody came to me, and um, I'll never forget his words. He said, if you would stop preaching on controversial subjects, you'd have the biggest church in town. And uh, I told him, I said, I'm not interested in having the biggest church in town for that reason. And then he, sa he said, there's another issue I have. What? He said, it's too much Bible. He said, you're just preaching through the Bible. Nobody wants to hear Leviticus. Nobody wants to hear this or that. <laughs> and he said, you would also have the biggest church in town because God's gifted you to preach. You can just preach on what is pertinent to our daily lives instead of verse by verse. It's hard to even come up with something to say after that. You know, when somebody says something like that to you. Um... I'm not jiving on stage. I like to walk around at times when I'm preaching. I, I am a preacher, but I don't change my voice. I, can you imagine if these guys talked in normal life like that? If they went into Nivis and goes, where's the Ugali? It, it's ridiculous. It really is. It's, it's hypocritical. Hypocritical means to put on a face, to put on a mask, to be somebody you're not, acting I don't, I don't like it. Now, I believe in tough preaching. I believe in raising our voice even at times as long as we're doing it in a loving way. But this issue, once again, that we find ourselves in, that we've taken a break of Romans. I know we had a break while I was in the States. But in, in, in studying Ezekiel, well, I, I don't know exactly. I've been praying. We'll, we may go into Daniel and we may get into Revelation. It could be a four to six to eight week study. It is so important because of what is happening in the days that we live in. You know, I, I don't want to, I want to get to this sermon. I really have like two sermons today. One is an deep exhortation at the end as we go through, uh, finish Ezekiel 38 and go through most of 39 today um, in kind of a overview exposition um, because we did a deep one last week. But, but listen, you wonder what, what, why prophecy is so important and why we stand with Israel. We keep saying that. Let me tell you what I mean by 
saying we stand with Israel. Let me tell you what I mean. I mean that we believe in God's covenant with Israel. We believe in God's covenant with Israel. Are we saying that Israel is a righteous nation? No, Israel is not a Christian nation. In fact, one of the largest communities of homosexuality is in Israel. They have rejected Jesus Christ. Now, during this conflict, I want you to know, because this is a staple of the Calvary movement in taking the Bible literally in its prophecy. We believe in the literal fulfillment of prophecy. And there's many debates on this. Um, you have amillennials, and you have preterists, and you have uh, postmillennialism. There's so many things that we'll cover when we start our Bible college out by the airport, hopefully within three years. But one of the largest reasons, and please pay attention to this, that the Jewish nation, Israel, has rejected Jesus Christ is because of a figurative view of prophecy. They don't believe in all the prophecies concerning the Messiah coming to conquer sin through a sacrificial death. They don't believe it. They don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They don't believe in the atonement for sins. In fact, Judaism is very similar to Islam in that you have to be a good person to go to heaven. Never mind all through the Bible, including the Old Testament and the book of Romans, there is none good, no, not one. And even in the, no, in the Old Testament, if you think that's just New Testament, in the Old Testament it says that our works to God is the context. And I'm trying not to speak so fast, but... Our works to God are as filthy rags. It is offensive to say, God, here's our works. That means I'm saved. That means you, you have to receive me into he heaven. You, that, that my sins are blotted out. Now, we're supposed to do good works. Don't get me wrong. But it's an entirely different doctrine doing them to enter heaven as doing them because you love Jesus Christ. Entirely different. And these Jews don't believe they need a Messiah to cleanse us from sin. They believe they need a Messiah to cleanse them from the nations on earth, which that will happen as we're studying. But the point is, a figurative view of prophecy can even lead you to disbelieve in the cross of Jesus Christ. Doesn't always, for there are men who are all millennial who believe in the cross, but it led the Jews to do so. That's very dangerous. And the study that we're doing in Ezekiel 38 and 39, guys, it doesn't get more literal than this. They are talking about a specific war with specific nations, with a specific outcome that God will render victory all by himself. The nation of Israel doesn't have to pick up a sword. And when we say that we stand for Israel. We're not saying that we hate races other than Israel. It's even shameful that I even have to say this next statement. It's not saying that we hate Palestinian children. In the last, you, you know, this is our home for 13 years now, me and my family. I spend half of my time in the U.S. for the sole purpose of preaching our responsibility to orphans and raising money for it. I do not hate children, as I've been accused of this last few weeks. We had a drunkard try to break in to the church. We have people living here at the church. They tried to break in, and when Mike was trying to get him off of the property, he said, your church supports terrorism. He said this at 3 a.m. when he was drunk. No, when we say we stand for Israel, God has made a covenant with Israel, brothers and sisters. He has made a covenant with them. They are his people. And he will save them. He will deliver them. And they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ one day. The Bible teaches us that. 
to give the implication, which I did not appreciate, I'm sure you don't know what I'm talking about, but to give the implication that to stand with Israel is to stand against Christ is a false dichotomy. You can stand with a nation and simultaneously stand with Christ. For example, if Al-Shabaab came in from Somalia, which they have many times into Kenya, you guys know about the Westgate attack, you know about the bombing of the embassy, we know about all the bombings and shootings in Garissa and northern Kenya, and all that's happened to our nation here. Yes, I said our nation, fellow Kenyans. If Al-Shabaab came in from the Somali border and took 1,800 of our women and children hostage, and uh, n never mind how we feel about the current government, and the president came on live television and said, we're declaring war with Somalia, we're going in to get our women and children, would you be for Kenya? We had one person shake their head. Let me tell you, you would be and guess what? You would be if it was your child that was taken to Somalia. No, we stand for Christ and we stand for Israel. Here in Ezekiel 38, let's pick up, we'll backtrack to verse 10, then I'm just going to read all the way into 39. We'll give a brief uh, summary, expositional summary, and then we will get into the final exhortation. We'll try to end on time today. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are inhabited and against a people gathering from the nations who dwell in the midst of the land Shedan, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and their young lions will say to you, some, just to, some believe this is Spain, who want to partake in the riches of Israel with the nations attacking Israel, but also some uh, believe that it's Great Britain, who has a lot of trade in the Middle East um, with even many of the enemies of Israel, and the young lions are America, because we were a British colony at one time. Um, that's very hard to verify and even harder to verify than what we identified the other nations at the beginning of this chapter uh, were. So just food for thought. Interesting, I think, nonetheless. And their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to take away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Verse 14, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus say, says the Lord God, on that day, my people, when my people, when my people, I'm going to do that Pentecostal thing, when my people, who are God's people? Israel. Now, his people are his church too, but that's not the subject of the day, and they are separate. God has prophecy for his church. We're going to get into that. That's the rapture. And God has prophecy for Israel because he's made a covenant with both, and neither one replaces the other. When my people... Excuse me. Then you will come from your place of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding horses in great company and mighty army. You will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? who prophesied for years in those days that I will bring you against them? And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, 
that my fury will show in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, all men who are in the face of the earth shall shake in my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring them to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed, and will rain down on them, on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> I'll keep reading, but I'm, I, you know, you pause for a moment and you look at this. And last week when I was debating a certain individual concerning standing with Israel taking a stand, I got the, it, it was uh, mostly WhatsApp messages, and, and you guys remember the bracelets, WWJD? You guys remember those? Did they come to Kenya? No? That's all right. Most people didn't do what Jesus would do anyway, so no problem. WWJD is what would Jesus do? And at least in America, when I was growing up, they were passing, it was this huge movement. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And um, anyways, the movement died out, but the, I got that in the message. What would Jesus do when we're talking about Israel? What would Jesus do with, his, with these nations? What would Jesus do in the Gaza Strip? What would Jesus do with Palestine? What would Jesus do? Listen, I am not for killing anyone. It is not my job. I am for preaching the gospel. I will preach it to Israelis, Palestinians. I will give them food. I will give them shelter if it was within my ability to do it. But God is going to kill more people of the nations that come against Israel than anybody has in human history. That's what Jesus is going to do. So it was futile to give me the WWJD. I quoted Ezekiel 38 and many parts of Revelation. God must judge. Ephesians chapter 15. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is name. He is patient in his judgment. His first response is love. He wants people to be saved. He wants us to preach the gospel in every nation without respecter of persons, and we ought to. Um, the Bible says, the Apostle Peter, that God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. That's why one day is, is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But ladies and gentlemen, may I ask this question? Should God, should Jesus Christ allow the world to continue as it is always? We're talking 70 million babies have been murdered in America. 70 million babies. What Islam is doing across the world and don't become all politically correct. They are destroying people's lives. It is a religion of hate, oppression, and tyranny. Is God supposed to let this continue? And then on top of that, as the context is, is God supposed to allow these nations to destroy Israel, his covenant people? He is not that kind of God. He is a man of war and he will destroy the nations that come against Israel. Make no mistake about it. You know, I, I got people get, getting offended with me. I haven't even used such language as God is using bloodshed, earthquakes, mountains coming down on people. 
What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus has been patient for a very long time because he is a loving God. But his patience concerning his judgment will end on this world. And we better be on the right side. Chapter 39, verse 1. Let me just read most of this chapter and then we're going to talk about it. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog. Remember, he's the leader of Russia. The spirit of Antichrist is upon him. The spirit of Antichrist is upon those who are coming against Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am God against you, O Gog, the prince of Rush, Meshach, Tubal, possibly Russia, Moscow, and Tublaski, and I will turn you around and lead you on bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. It's probably missiles. In the Hebrew, it's fiery darts. It's kind of the same language um, with Ephesians 6, that the enemy shoots fiery darts upon God's people. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel and all your troops and people who are with you. I will give you the birds of prey for every sort to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field for I have spoken, says the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security of, in the coastlands. Fire! We'll explain that, what that could be in a moment. Then they shall know that I am the Lord so I will make my holy name in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Now before I continue reading, notice that God is not only identifying Israel as His people. In other words, He is for Israel. He takes it a step ver further in the verse that I just read that he is the Holy One in Israel. So not only does he identify himself as being for Israel, he identifies with the people in their nation. I am in there. I am, I am an Israelite. I'm, those, I'm one of them. And I will not let my name be profaned, my holy name, anymore. I will not allow my holy name to be profaned. You know, I keep stopping. You know, I, I, guys, sometimes I look at, and you guys are wonderful. I, I, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I, 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 sometimes I look at my own heart. And I ask myself the question, am I crazy? Am I just some nutso psychopath? Because yesterday I walked by an altar where people pray and worship to Mary. And I see this, hundreds of people around. And I wonder, is anybody else offended with this? I'm offended. I'm upset about it. I'm angry about it. I think, as we say in Kenya, it's high time to start defending our Savior, Jesus Christ, with holy living and proper preaching. Our God's name is being profaned throughout the nations. When I saw him, that Hindu temple in town, uh, and, um, by the river there, when it was being built, I was offended. When I see mosque being built, I am offended. That doesn't mean I don't love those people. But I am offended that my God's name is being blasphemed. I love him with all of my heart. And listen... Guys, if we can defend our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, do you remember what it was like? Did, is this a cultural thing or did people talk bad about your moms in Kenya too? Did they do that? Like a, a mom diss? You guys probably are more respectful than Americans in that way, aren't you? you? You know, if somebody was really angry at you in America growing up, they gave a mom joke. Is there mom jokes in Kenya? There is. Oh, so you're just as disrespectful as Americans. 
And I was such an angry young man because of abuse and my family was divorced and that it became such a thing that my brothers, or excuse me, one of my brothers, he would actually tell his older friends, go tell Josh, make fun of our mom, say something evil about our mom. So even at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, these 15, 16, and 17 year olds, in order to get me to fight them, they would come say something about my mom. And I would go crazy. <laughs> and I'd try to hurt them. Now, a, a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old cannot beat up an 18 year old. Their, their, their muscles have developed. So guess what? I got beat all the time. Until one day, there, you know, it didn't happen as much anymore, but I got upset when people would talk about my mom and they would say terrible things, sexual things, evil things. Terrible things about my mom. Oh, it made me angry, guys. Has anybody gotten a fight to defend your family? Oh, man. You guys don't raise your hands, but you said yes. Why? Because we love our mom. We love our dad. We love our brothers. We love our sisters. Why are we so unwilling to fight for Jesus Christ and what dishonors his name? Why? Why do we continually walk by altars that are praying to Mary, mosques that are worshiping a false god, and Hindus that pray to 300 million gods? And why do we not preach against it? I tell you why. Because we have been lied to. And the lie is we should be ecumenical. We should be pluralistic. Don't offend, don't offend, don't offend. And that is a lie from hell. Defend your king. Defend your God. Defend your friend. Because when people come against the nation of Israel, Jesus Christ knows how to defend those who belong to him. And he will. So when you're not defending Jesus Christ, you're not behaving like Jesus Christ because he will defend those who belong to him. Praise God for that. He will defend his church and he will defend the nation of Israel. And I am so glad we serve a God like that. So glad that we serve a God like that. Isn't it comforting to know God will fight for you? Protect you? I, I submit to you that we start preaching against the, those things that profane the name of Jesus Christ. And these type of altars profane his name. We don't got to hit no one. We don't got to hate anyone. But we defend nevertheless. In love, yes, but nevertheless we defend. So, I am the Lord. I'm the Holy One in Israel. Surely the day is coming and shall be done that the Lord God, this day of which I have spoken, those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire, burn the weapons, burn the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field. This is why I believe this war happened right before the seven-year tribulation. Um... This will not take wood from the field nor cut down any wood from the forest because they will make fires and weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and they will pillage those who pillage them, says the Lord God. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place in Israel, the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers because there they will bury Gog and his multitude. Therefore they will... Call it in the valley of Hammond, God, for seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people and the land will be burying. They will gain renown from that day, and I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. In the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land. And when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hammond Gog. The name of the city shall be called 
Hamanon, thus they shall cleanse the land. And we'll stop there today. Did you guys notice, I forgot to mention, it's up here somewhere. He says, I am against you, talking about those nations against Israel. I am against you. That's what Jesus Christ says. WWJD, what would Jesus do? He is against those nations who are against Israel. He is for the nations who are for. So let me set the scene real quick, and then we'll get into some exhortation. Last, or two Sundays ago, we talked about the nations, the beginning of Ezekiel 38. One of these nations is going to be kind of the leader in the alliance against Israel, that is Russia. The ruler of that nation is going to lead this alliance of nations, which are nations including, uh, and not limited to, I don't want to uh, li- mention them all, but Turkey and Iran and ancient Ethiopia and Sudan and Libya and Algeria um, and, and uh, 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 possibly Poland, possibly Czech Republic, possibly Germany. Um, all these nations coming against Israel. We know the location. They're going to come from the north. They're going to come into the Jordan Valley. There's going to be mountains. We know what's going to happen. God is going to destroy every single person in this army, confederate of armies. Not one is going to survive. Not one is going to live and He's going to do it by his own hand. He's not going to require the nation of Israel to fight out in this particular battle. He's going to do it through an earthquake. Um, There's fault lines that go through that area. The Bible told us that this earthquake will shake the whole world. Um, Scientists have estimated that an 8.2 earthquake is the size required in that particular area of the Jordan Valley with all those cliffs that are mentioned here, and they're still there today. They're going to come down. That that size of earthquake could shake tremors across the entire planet, and it would. Just like it's spoken here, that the whole world will feel this earthquake. They're going to go out into the field. They're going to go out like a cloud. They're going to be in somewhat different locations. And with this... Hey, can you turn the, the, the fans off? I, I'm getting dizzy looking at this video over here. I get the worst motion sickness you guys can't even imagine. It's very strange. Thank you. This is going to be happening. Now, one thing that it mentions is that fire is going to come down upon these people. Interestingly enough, years ago, as Pastor Chuck Smith taught this portion of Scripture, right during the week that he taught this Scripture was the week that a news article came out in Newsweek magazine. And they, they weren't Christians, but they were describing asteroids and comets that were going by the earth all the time. And did you guys know that at least 10 times a year... The NASA space station and different government uh, space stations around the world have to watch to see if different asteroids are going to strike Earth because they come so close. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are around Jupiter and uh, all these asteroids and rocks, they kick out of Jupiter in their orbit and they make their way towards Earth. Uh, Not just, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, around that time, we had a near miss of 10 million miles. But still, when it's a planet killer, it, be- it makes people nervous. But the interesting part about this near miss is they didn't know the asteroid was there until it was passing Earth. So it would have hit without our knowledge. And that's why one of the reasons so many people are in space doing their satellites so they can monitor what's going on in outer space. Well, the scientist who wrote this article went on to explain that um, uh, that if an asteroid came down, now depending on the size is depending on the damage. One mile square, or whatever that is in kilometers, 2.5 kilometers square, would destroy all life on Earth. 
We know that's not going to happen because God has told us what's going to happen. But it would destroy all life on earth. This particular occasion that's being described, this war in Ezekiel 38, it's possible that it is an asteroid. The size that would accomplish what God wants it to accomplish with this army because of the fire that's raining down. The scientists in this article explain that it, if asteroid come down and hit, what it does is it incinerates the ground immediately. And that's why ash would go up. But also, because of the powerful force of it hitting from outer space, it would send debris and form clusters like rocks that would go into the inner outer atmosphere, not quite space, and the gr gravitational pull of Earth would bring it back down. And because of this motion, that these clusters would actually catch on fire, raining balls of fire on Earth. Scientists said this is the kind of event, if an asteroid hit, hailstones of fire. Well, this is possibly what Ezekiel 39 is describing. Anyways, God sends down an earthquake, he, he, he sends down balls of fire, and he destroys and kills everybody that is involved in these uh, nations and these armies that are coming against Israel. And then they'll be buried. Something interesting that uh, is being described here, now remember this is written 2,600 years ago, is that they will set apart in verse 14... Men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when anyone sees a man's bone, he'll set up a marker, and then these men of renown who are regularly employed will come, and they will do the proper thing needed to dispose of this. Now, this is interesting. They're getting men of renown, so professionals in their field, and the field is safely disposing. They don't have regular people when they see bones, so take a break, you're going to go cleanse it, and then you're going to wait seven months, then you're going to go back in, and you're going to set up markers of where the bones are, and then the professionals are going to come in and they're going to do the proper requirements to make it safe. Many believe, and I hold to this position, and the reason why I'm not being dogmatic on it is because it is somewhat speculative, is that this is describing nuclear or biological warfare 2,600 years ago when nuclear or biological warfare did not exist. Zechariah, I believe in chapter 14, also does a job of that by saying that these type of calamities and wars that are happening in the end times, by the way, the times that we're living in right now, that the, the eye sockets will be sucked back in people's heads. Now, how do you like hearing that from your pastor on Sunday morning? You just wanted to come and get your marriage fixed. I think prophecy can do that. Get right with J Jesus and get right with your wife because the end is near. That's your marriage counseling for the day. Guys, the Bible is describing nuclear or biological warfare. That's what it's describing. It's describing lengths of time because of radiation or biological poisoning. It's describing professional people, probably in hazmat suits, that need to come and cleanse the area. To the best of their abilities. Now, whether it is or whether it's not describing these things, and, and, and it is accurately describing what would happen, we know for sure that God is going to destroy these nations that come against Israel. We take this literally. You know... You look at this stuff, and I want to remind us what I was telling you last week. Why are we talking about this? People are hungry. People need school fees for their children's uh, basic education, even reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
Um, my husband just left. My child was born handicapped. We need a neuroscientist to look at my kid's brain. All these things going on with members of our church. Husband left. Husband spent all the money. We have no food. I'm a single mother and I'm suffering. On and on the list goes. I, I was raped and impregnated. I was molested. Horrible things. Horrible things of people right in, in our room here. Why are we talking about prophecy? What are we, what are we talking about? There's many reasons we should be talking about. One of it is this. The Bible has spoken the end from the beginning, ladies and gentlemen. And God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, says he's coming back for us. He's going to wipe the way, uh, away our tears. He loves you. He hasn't forgotten you, okay? He hasn't forgotten you. He knows what you're going through. He has a plan. He has a plan. It's a good plan. It's sad what's going to happen. I, I wish everybody in the world would get saved and stop blaspheming. I wish. I do. I don't want people to die. I don't want people to suffer. But God's going to do what he knows is right. He's going to do what he has to do. And the encouragement for us this morning is God hasn't forgotten his people. He hasn't forgotten his church. And he hasn't forgotten the nation of Israel. He's made promises to us, guys. He's made promises, and he's going to fulfill those promises. It's, and it's encouraging to know, hey, he, even, he knows enough to prophesy about nations that would come against Israel before there was any of these nations coming against Israel. And he will keep his promises to his church. He'll protect us. So I want to encourage you with that, but also... I want to exhort you with something else. Here in John chapter 6, verse 66, the Bible says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Think about that. Think about that. When we think of Jesus, we should rightly think of him as king, as Lord, as Messiah, as God, as the creator of the heavens and the earth. We, we think of him in those terms because the Bible has revealed to us that that's exactly who he is. But never forget for a moment that he's human, not was human. He is human, still to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, he's one of us. He's one of us. And when I think of this question that he asked his disciples, the first thing that comes to my mind and heart is his humanity. He looks at his companions. He looks at his friends. He looks at those whom he loves. He looks at those who he's been hanging out with for a couple years. He's been eating with them. You guys know the fellowship of eating with people. Going out with your friends. You get enough money to buy some cuckoo. You sit there with half a chicken. Or a whole chicken if you're really hungry. And you have the chips and you get the tomato sauce and you put it all over, and you're eating and you're laughing what does it do it just creates this bond a love and he looks at his friends and he says are you going to leave me too I, I hear his humanity Peter has a shining moment Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, it is for their sakes that Jesus asked them their question, his question. But guess what? What an encouragement to the Lord. 
What an encouragement. I'm asking you as a church, those whom I love, and most of you love me back. No, all of you. Don't leave because we're being controversial. Don't run away because, guys, I'm a fighter. That's who God made me to be. But don't think for a second that I don't have fears. Loneliness, hurt, pain. Don't leave. Don't leave. You know, I, I, you, you got people talking bad about our church once again all over this town. Go teach them the Bible. Let's stop having the name of Christ blasphemed in, in our world. Love people, but preach nonetheless. When we think of preaching, you guys are preachers, you know that? You're called to go proclaim the truth. In Matthew 15, Jesus says, the scribe and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why did your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands. And the worship team, please come up. They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And Jesus answered them, why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or his mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift of God, then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect because your tradition. Hypocrites! Hypocrites! He tells the most powerful religious leaders in the world that they are hypocrites. What a man of courage. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, the people draw near to me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And then you skip to verse 14. Excuse me, verse 12. And the disciples came to Jesus and said to him, don't you know that you offended the Pharisees? <laughs> Can you imagine how embarrassed the disciples are of Jesus Christ? How embarrassed they are. Oh, can you imagine the moment, guys? Can you imagine them like biting their nails if they did that back then? Jesus is rebuking these pastors, calling them hypocrites in front of everyone. It can be awkward when two people disagree on a stage in front of everyone, can't it? Oh, man. Jesus is so much more courageous than any of us. Hypocrites. Woe unto you, blind leaders of the blind. And the, and the disciples are back there going, oh, why is he so harsh? Peter, go talk to him. All right, I got this. If you just adopted a more loving method of sharing with people, I think we could win more converts. Jesus, if, if you just, listen, clearly... If the book of how to win friends and influence people was out during our time, Jesus, you would have more people who would follow you. Jesus' disciples say, you offended them. He says, leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. Don't follow those people. Don't follow their ways. Their, their mouth, they... They, they turn the doctrines of the Bible into the doctrines of men and they command people in the doctrines of men, not the doctrines of God. Guys, it is time. We live in, in the end times. We need to make a stand for Jesus Christ. And we need to say he's our God, he's our king, he's our master, and I'm sick and tired of him being blasphemed. God is looking for people. And I believe... He has called our church for such a time as this, Calvary Chapel Eldoret, to stand up in the midst of controversy. I believe that. And guess what? God is not with us. We are with him. And as long as we proclaim the truth, his Holy Spirit will be upon of our church. The moment we stop preaching truth is the moment the Holy Spirit is not upon our church. He'll be in the believer because they're born again, but he will not be upon our church in power. I promise you that. The moment that we become ecumenical, 
trying to get along with every other church, even if those church are blaspheming God, is the moment that the Holy Spirit is not pouring out upon us. And God's pouring out upon us, guys. We have people getting saved. I do have a testimony, and, and I want you to pray for it because you know how land issues are very funny in Kenya. Land issues, they bring so much insecurity. <laughs> do, do a land search. Oh, it's clean. Do another land search. It's clean. Okay, let me hire a lawyer for my lawyer and have them do a land search and investigate my lawyer. It's clean. <laughs> Is it clean? We were doing, uh, I was looking at an acre of land. I don't want to show you yet because I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to go through the process first. It's very nearby. And I, I went out there and the, finally the owner, you know how it is getting through the brokers, right? It's hard. The brokers want to protect their asset of giving a percentage of the money to themselves. And, and I understand that. And if they're working, they, but they need to be a little more honest, but. I found the owner, finally we're on the land, and it, it says, we're only on half an acre. We need more room. Our events are more than we can fit in this room. We need more. So we, the Lord has plans. So I go on the, uh, the acre. Did I just point where it is? It's over there. <laughs> and the guy's like, it's 85 million, 85.5. I'm like, ah, another number that is, you might as well tell me 100 billion. I don't have, I don't have it. Two days later, I got a call from an anonymous person who says, I want to give the money for that land. And we're in the process of buying that land for our church. Yeah. Guys, only God does that stuff. I didn't solicit from that person. I didn't go to that person and say, hey, can we have the money? None of it. That's the hand of God. And just so you know, you're like, well, what's wrong with this place? A, it's too small, and B, we don't own this land. And now God has made a way for Calvary Chapel Eldoret to own the land so they can permanently reside in this city proclaiming the gospel. Yeah. I've been waiting for this for 13 years. I can't wait to show you the building that we're going to build over there. If God allows. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for your word. Maybe you're a visitor here today as your heads are bowed. Listen, and you're, you're not born again. You've been running from God. Or you're backslidden. You're in sin, whatever that sin may be. Sexual immorality, drunkenness, pornographic use. Uh, whatever, it, whatever it is, or you did something you didn't think you could be forgiven of, uh, abortion. Uh, I don't know what it is. There's so many sins. And you've been running from God. I want you to know God loves you, and he wants to forgive you. But you must confess the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to pray for you in just a moment. Lord, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon every person here now. And if there's those among us, and that who are not born again or who are backslidden, I pray your Holy Spirit would convict them, would come upon them. I want to pray for you. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, whether you're backslidden or you need to be born again, I want to pray for you. I want you to raise your hand right now where you sit, and I'm going to pray for you. Anyone, raise your hand where you sit, and I'm going to pray. You want to come back to Christ? Yes, yes. Keep your hands raised. Anybody else? You want, a, you want a relationship with the Lord? Anybody else? Let me pray for these raising their hand. Lord, thank you for these raising their hand. I pray you pour out your spirit upon them. You know their stories, Lord. You know their stories better than I do. You know their stories better than they do. Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord, we ask. Bless them. Show them that you're with them. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. If you've raised your hand, just lift them up high so we can recognize you. Lift your hand up high, anyone? Right here, right here. You can put your hands down. Guys, if you receive Christ, go to that Connect station. Sign up for the class. Sign up for, say you became a new believer. We want to call you. We want to uh, uh, talk to you. We want to pray for you. And we love you so much. Let's stand as we sing this last song. We'll have the ushers and deacons come forward. And may God bless you, church. Lord, we pray you would receive this offering. In Jesus' name, amen.